Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Danielle Parker, and I'm the Executive Director of the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia. I'm really excited today to be joined by two of the staff people from the West Virginia Community Development Hub. Today, I have Taylor Bennett, who is the Community-Based Policy Coordinator, and Emma Pepper, who is the Director of Strategic Network Communication. And they're going to be doing a webinar today about entitled Building a Strong Coalition and talk uh, some about advocacy for historic preservation projects. Throughout the webinar today, if you have any questions, feel free to submit those through the questions or the chat box. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can reach out to me in a private message and I'll be happy to help you deal with that issue. And I'm just gonna hand it right over to Taylor and Emma, who again, I would like to thank for joining us today. Awesome. Uh Hi, everybody. My name is Taylor Bennett. I am the Community-Based Policy Coordinator at the West Virginia Community Development Hub. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today. Um, and I'm joined by Emma. Emma, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Emma Pepper, and I am the Director of Strategic Network Communications at the West Virginia Community Development Hub. And I am also very excited to be here with you today. Um, fantastic. So uh, I'll give you just a little bit about what my, why Danielle asked us specifically to talk about the, um, how to build a strong coalition. Um, a big part of my job and one of the favorite, one of my favorite parts of my job is uh, working on uh, policy and advocacy issues with the Abandoned Properties Coalition. Um, so I help support our policy teams um, in advocating for and setting their policy goals every year. Um, and that work has kind of taught me a lot about what it takes to build a strong coalition and what a strong coalition can do um, once that's put together. Um, so I think we're going to launch right into our content. So before we get started, um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, our goals for the day. Um, so our goals for the session are um, to kind of give you some actionable steps to build a team of people who you can work alongside of what, who can work alongside of you to support uh, the projects and the goals that you have. Um, we've got some tips for you to leverage uh, all of your teamwork to tell your story um, and help uh, your project uh, reach your goals. Um, and we want to make sure that there were, uh, is some time today to respond to any questions uh, or challenges that you're facing uh, with specific projects that you're taking on. Um, so that's what we'll be working on today. Uh, and I figured before we uh, get too far along, I wanted to take a moment to uh, really kind of zero in on what we're talking about when we talk about working in coalition. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about working in coalition, um, I think we're talking about a group of individuals or organizations who come together to work on a specific goal or issue. Um, it's a little different from a team, and we'll talk more about teams in a little bit, but it's a little bit different from a team in that I feel like a team is a group of people who are all kind of uh, in agreement on what their goal is and why they're all there, whereas a coalition might be bigger than a team. It might include more individuals or organizations, and those individuals or organizations might have different motivations for being part of the coalition, um, but they're working together on the same goal or issue. The other thing that I think it's really important to talk about when we talk about working in coalition is to talk about uh, the fact that a coalition doesn't necessarily have to be formalized. Um, the Abandoned Properties Coalition is a very formal coalition. We've got bylaws and membership and a steering committee and all of that, but a coalition uh, can also just be a group of people who you've brought together um, who's all kind of working together towards the same goal, even if you don't have any kind of formal, formalized group or anything like that. So um, we're kind of, the, 
the topics that we'll be talking about today will be useful um, kind of for any group of folks working on an issue in between really formalized groups and groups that are kind of uh, ad hoc and just kind of coming together uh, to work on an issue informally. All right, so there are four steps to building a strong coalition. The first one is to set your goal. Um, the second is to build your team. The third is to build your coalition. Um, and then the fourth is to tell your story. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit too about why we work in coalition or why you might choose to work in coalition. Uh, most of the, the stuff that we'll be talking about today, I'll be talking about through the lens of my experience with the Abandoned Properties Coalition. Um, but this information could totally apply to any coalition or group that you're working with. Um, and uh, the first reason that I found that it's really effective to work in coalition is that there's strength in a collective voice. So when more people are, are after the same thing um, and you're advocating about it together, uh, that information or that collective voice um, is amplified. It, it kind of has more weight. The second is that um, by working in coalition, your group is, is able to set goals together that individual members or organizations may not be able to set for themselves. Uh, this could be true for a number of reasons. Um, it, in the APC, we've got some members of our coalition who are not able to engage in advocacy work. Um, but by being part of the coalition, they're able to kind of contribute what they're advocacy goals would be and then allow other members of the coalition to take those on. So um, that's a reason that we found that coalitions are particularly effective. Um, and then the other is that you've got more folks, you've got more people to work on uh, your goal and so you end up getting more done. Um, so those are kind of three primary reasons why coalition work can be really impactful. Um, all right, so the first step, as we mentioned, is setting your goal. Um, so uh, you may kind of enter into uh, this webinar and into at, like the advocacy work already having a goal, right? Um, so most folks start out with a fairly simple goal um, and it could be something like save the old schoolhouse. Um, or make it easier to restore historic buildings. Um, so something that's kind of broad, but, but also very simple in concept. Um, this simple goal often has an underlying policy goal and it, finding out what that underlying policy goal is uh, may take some time and digging to figure out. Uh, the, the kind of digging that we're talking about here is probably gonna look like meeting with either like local staff members of your local government, um, maybe some elected officials or other individuals who are already taking action on the issue that you've identified. Um, so what you're looking for as you're having these meetings is you're looking for um, uh, to identify the actual change that needs to take place in order for your goal to be met. So for example, um, we use the example of kind of save the old schoolhouse. So that goal could become transfer ownership of, this, uh, of the school uh, from the school board to the historical society so that it can become a museum. So you can see how it goes from being kind of really broad to very specific. And that very specific goal that you're going to kind of do some digging and identify, that really specific goal is the actionable part. That's the part where um, if you were gonna ask for what you wanted, that's what you would be asking for. Um, so another example might be uh, of a specific um, like underlying policy goal would be uh, to rezone the land that the schoolhouse is on so that it can be repurposed into a single family home. Um, so whatever your goal is, um, you're gonna try and distill your goal down to a single sentence. Um, the, the example of making it easier to restore historic buildings could become pass a policy which increases the state historic tax credit. Um, we saw that happen a couple years ago and, and hopefully we'll see that happen again in the near future here. 
Um, so taking the time to figure out what this underlying goal is, is vital to the success of your coalition. Um, it does a couple things for you. Uh, the um, so it points you to the person or the group who will need to make the change. So that's the person whose mind you'll need to change in order to reach your goal. Um, it may also help you identify potential coalition members you may not have thought of before. Um, yeah, so this will help you um, identify. So when we talk about identifying um, the, the specific people or person whose mind you're going to need to change in order to reach your goal. If we're talking about, you know, transferring ownership of the, of the school from the school board to the historical society, the, the group of folks whose minds you're going to have to change is obviously the school board. Um, so, uh, but without distilling your, uh, your goal down into that single sentence, um, it would be difficult to kind of uh, figure out who that decision maker might be. Hey Taylor, can I add something here? Absolutely. Uh, this is Emma, everyone. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, this more later, uh, but this goal is also really important um, because these people that you're interested in influencing or those minds that you need to change in order to reach your goal, that same group of people will become your audience later, your target audience when you're thinking about how to tell your story. So we'll speak more in depth about that later, but I just wanna kind of put, um, for you to put a pin in that in your mind, because we'll return to that concept later when I talk a bit more about telling your story. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Um, all right. So that's kind of the, the first step to building a strong coalition um, is kind of setting your goal. The second step is to build your team. Um, so I've got a couple questions here which are going to hopefully help us think through um, like just these are some things that I think about when I'm thinking about building a, a strong team that's gonna help me reach the goal that I wanna reach. So um, your team is gonna be a core group of people who feel strongly enough to work together um, to achieve your goal. Um, and you might come into coalition building with a team already. If so, that's awesome. Um, if it's just you, that's okay too. Uh, this is a moment to sit down either on your own or with the core group of folks that you're bringing with you and identify um, what your dream team is going to look like. Uh, so here's a few ideas to help guide your thinking. Um, who is already working on this? So think through who in your community maybe is already taking action on this issue um, or on issues that are kind of directly adjacent to the issue that you're working on. Are there folks that are already kind of making moves on this uh, goal that you have um, and if so, can you engage with them? Um, the next question is, uh, what, what work needs to be done? So think about the jobs that need to be done in order to reach the goal that you have. Uh, will you need to speak to elected officials? Then maybe you wanna invite somebody to join your team who's really good at that. Will you need to plan an event for the community? Um, maybe you need to recruit uh, somebody who's really excited about event planning. Um, so, and then the last question that I have is, um, think through, it, it can be really, really helpful to think through uh, what other people are directly impacted by the outcome that you're seeking. Um, so, for example, if you're interested in history, in restoring a historic building because you're a member of the local historic preservation society, perhaps a neighboring property owner might also be interested in uh, kind of achieving the same goal that you're after as a way to improve their property value. Um, so you can also think about residents who are living and working in the community and may be impacted by the work that you're doing. Um, who lives in your neighborhood, who owns a business here, 
what faith-based groups like churches are nearby, it's important to consider how uh, these kinds of groups will be represented as you plan um, to reach your goal. So as you're building your team, kind of asking yourself these, th these three questions, who's already working on the issue? What work do we need to do? What roles do I need for people to play on my team? And then who is impacted by the situation? Those are three questions that can really guide um, kind of how you think about building a strong team that's gonna help you reach your goal. Um, Emma, do you have anything to add about team building? Yeah, this is making me think about this question of diverse representation. Um, and when I talk about diversity, um, I'm not necessarily talking about demographics, although that's really important. Um, but I'm thinking about diverse, like a diversity of perspectives on your team. Mm -hmm. um, when we're thinking about the redevelopment of historic properties and communities specifically, that can bring out a lot of sensitivities in the community. I'll tell uh, a very brief example. This just happened to me yesterday on social media. I live in Kanawha County and our, um, our library is being renovated right now. And um, the Office of Public Art here in Charleston posted that um, the uh, public art sculpture um, that is at the uh, at the opening door to our local library is going to be moved, relocated during the renovation. And then they didn't say anything else about where it was going to be relocated and gave the impression that it may not come back to the library. And so, of course, this is uh, something that's like adjacent to the actual redevelopment of the property, but I read this on social media and was heartbroken, right? And I am just a concerned community member who's really invested in the library. Um, and thankfully, someone came back on later and commented and said that the piece is going to go back to um, the library. But if you have that kind of diverse representation on in your coalition with you, that's going to be really helpful in getting different kinds of perspectives that's going to support you in your messaging and telling the story of what you're doing so that you'll be likelier to have positive buy-in from the community around you. Thanks, Emma, that's so important. Yeah, so, um, all right. So you set your goal, uh, you built your team, um, and now it's time to build your coalition. Uh, so the first step to building a strong coalition is to understand your decision makers. So we talked before about how distilling that goal that you have down to one sentence and finding the underlying policy goal can help you identify who those key decision makers are uh, that will later become your audience that you're going to tell your story to, but the people whose minds you need to change. Um, so it's important to think back to, to who you identified. So let's imagine that it's the school board. Um, um, all right, then you want to ask yourself uh, a couple key questions about the, uh, about the decision makers that you've identified. The first is, uh, so what motivates them? What, why are they, why are they on the school board? Why are they doing what they're doing? Um, what, who do they listen to? So who, whose opinions, whose perspectives are they influenced by? Um, and, and what are their values? Um, what do, what guides their decision making generally? Um, so this is a, these are difficult questions to ask and they're difficult questions to answer. This can be really challenging, especially if the decision makers that you're trying to influence have a different set of values than you do. Um, or, you know, I mean, and that I, again, I think points back to what Emma was saying about having a, a, a diversity of perspectives on your team. Um, and and the, the broader uh, you can kind of have different perspectives on your team, uh, the more you may be able to kind of anticipate what uh, decision makers might be thinking. 
Um, so let's see. Um, work, you want to work to figure out where uh, the like what you have in common with folks who also care about what you're working on. So um, I'm going to I'm going to give an example here of uh, something that we that I worked on this past legislative session um, that I think is going to a good representation of what we're talking about here. So um, I was working on a policy uh, with uh, our land reuse team on the abandoned properties coalition and the land reuse team had identified that they needed to uh, save the right of first refusal for land reuse agencies at the county tax sale. This is kind of a really wonky sort of policy objective that they identified, but the, the members of this team identified that land reuse agencies, this policy change would support land reuse agencies in um, kind of taking on the problem of vacant and dilapidated properties in the, the municipalities that have land reuse agencies. And one of the things that we identified was that, so vacant and dilapidated properties can cause a public health and safety concern for a number of reasons. Um, not the least of which is that sometimes fires start in uh, abandoned properties and then firefighters have to go and put out the fire. And if land reuse agencies have those properties uh, on as like, like on their books, if they have ownership over those properties, then they can give um, firefighters a heads up about, hey, there's a big old hole in the floor of this building, uh, don't go running right in there. Um, and they can actually keep first responders safer as they respond to calls at these uh, these properties, right? Um, so while it might seem like uh, we have two different it might seem like there are two different goals here. Firefighters want to keep communities safer by putting out fires. Land reuse agencies want to um, address problem properties. But what we found was that these two really different groups ended up having the same goal, which was secure these vacant and dilapidated properties and help keep firefighters safe as they're responding to um, to calls at these properties. Um, and then so. We ended up, the team ended up um, bringing in uh, a bunch of kind of advocacy groups related to first responders into our coalition. And so we had really different kind of overarching missions or reasons for being um, as organizations, but we were able to work together on this one goal because uh, we found common ground and kind of where our issue intersected or crossed over the goals that, that first responders had as well. Um, so thinking through where your goal might cross over or intersect with somebody else's goal, uh, the goals of a different person or group or organization, um, particularly, this was particularly important for our, our land reuse team because we knew that, um, I mean, our legislators at the Capitol uh, didn't, I mean, everybody feels like vacant and abandoned and dilapidated properties are a problem. Um, but they may not know who the Abandoned Properties Coalition is, and they certainly didn't know who the folks on the land reuse team were, but they definitely knew who their first responders were. Um, and they cared a lot about um, kind of uh, paying attention to and doing things that would support and help uh, first responders. So it made a lot of strategic sense for the team to kind of build in first responders to our coalition um, in addition to it being good for first responders, it was also really great for the advocacy efforts of our team. Um, all right, so that is kind of just an illustration of how building a coalition can, you kind of seek out different members of your coalition who you may not otherwise work with, who can make the case for your goal even stronger than it would be on its own. Um, and we would never have been able to do that with uh, with our first responders or um, kind of get our um, get our message in front of legislators if we hadn't been working hard to build relationships. So we we kind of worked through existing relationships that we had uh, with first responders groups 
And then we also worked hard to build relationships with, um, with our legislators uh, to make sure that we were able to kind of um, put our goal in front of them. And so we're going to that was kind of the work that we had to do on the front end to build the coalition. And um, Emma, I'm gonna to toss it over to you as we move into the kind of step four of building a strong coalition, which is telling your story. Thanks so much, Taylor. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you um, a bit about the storytelling piece of this kind of work. And when I, I'm going to give you some steps because I want you to have some actionable takeaways, but I want to let you know at the outset that um, I could go much deeper into any one of these areas that I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, and we are going to do Q&A at the end of this. So as I'm talking, if there's something that you want me to expand upon, just make a note about it and then ask us during the Q&A, and I would be happier to talk more about it. So I'm going to run through today the basics of how to tell, of how to build a strategy to tell your story. So when we're thinking about storytelling, especially today, um, I would say in modern era, but even especially in 2020, sometimes we think about let's just get this thing out there on social media first, right? It's the thing that's accessible to many of us. Um, and that may or may not be the right step for you. And I will explain to you why a little bit more in just a moment. Um, so can, um, can you advance the next slide, please, Taylor? Yeah. So I, I asked you to put a pin in a thought earlier about this idea of um, your original goal and the people whose minds you want to change or the people that you want to educate um, about the project that you're working on, because those same people are going to become your storytelling audience. And it's really important to get clear first on that goal, just like Taylor was saying, um, and then to get clear on who your corresponding audience is that relates to that goal. So your audience, which may be more than one audience, may be, for example, the members of the community who are going to be um, impacted by a project. It may be legislators. It may be um, faith-based groups in the area or service organizations that are serving the areas. So that all, again, maps back to that goal that you have. Um, and it's important to get really clear on who these people are. And then once you're clear on who the people are or the sets or categories of people are, to prioritize them. So your audience, um, should ideally never be everyone. Um, and then beyond that, if you find that you have, for example, seven different audiences or four different audiences, it's important to prioritize who is the most important audience that we need to reach in order to get to our goal. Taylor, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and the next thing you want to do after you're clear on those people and go audience by audience, starting with your using your prioritized list, think about how those people get their information. And one uh, tool that you can use in doing that is you can think about an individual person who may represent that entire audience and think about are they on Facebook? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Snapchat? Um, do they watch the evening news? Do they subscribe to the paper? Um, do they listen to any radio shows? Um, the big uh, 
uh, the big three when we're thinking of traditional media and you're doing this brainstorming is to always think through what's TV, what's radio, and what newspapers are in the area um, that these people may be interested in. And another thing to think about is where are they out and about in the community, right? Do they have certain businesses that they frequent? I went through this example one time um, with a community group, um, and we were talking about um, brainstorming information uh, for residents or brainstorming places where people get their information for residents in the community. And this community group said, you know, if we want all the movers and shakers in the community that we want to reach, they congregate every week at a certain time in the local McDonald's. And I was like, this is really important, right? Because this isn't the kind of thing that we typically think about um, when we're thinking about reaching an audience. Um, and the truth of the matter was, these, this community group could just go to the McDonald's on this day and let those key movers and shakers know about the projects that they're working on. And it would uh, make a world of difference for them in uh, trying to get positive buy-in from their community for the project. So let's talk a little bit more about social media um, because we do often decide that um, social media is a key place where um, folks get their information, especially in West Virginia. Um, West Virginia is on Facebook. Um, I can guarantee that um, if, depending on the age range of your target audience, um, but for the majority of us, our projects will be reaching adults in West Virginia, and they are on Facebook. Um, and so before we take to social media about our projects, this idea of coalition building and getting community buy-in or getting buy-in from the stakeholders that you're targeting um, before going on social media is really important. Um, because once you enter into the social media space, um, you are, you're opening yourself up to vulnerabilities uh, for your project. Um, there are a couple of key pieces of information that I want to give you about um, social media and some of you guys that we could talk about this more in Q&A um, that you may, I may be uh, talking to folks uh, here that already have this knowledge in their minds. But the first is that there are pre-existing storylines on social media platforms that are negative storylines about historic redevelopment of any kind, right? And so if you're doing um, any kind of historic redevelopment and you're moving into the social media space and starting to talk about it, you are going to become a part of pre-existing negative storylines, right? And so it's really important that you have that, um, the buy-in from the audience members that you feel good about before you move into that social media space. The second thing to think about before moving into a social media space is that the business models of Social, all social media platforms incentivize negative and inflammatory comments. Um, and so, and there's no way for us to change this. It's the way that their business models inherently work. And so people will see more of negative comments on social media. Um, and so again, that's why it's just really important to do that like pre-work before you start telling your story on social media um, so that you have a positive um, grounding and buy-in um, from the community or the stakeholders that you're trying to reach um, in advance. In the public library example uh, that I gave earlier, um, they have done a really good uh, job of that. And so when I saw that post about the public art piece being moved, I didn't immediately react to it. I mean, of course, knowing what I know anyway, but I didn't immediately react to it with uh, 
a sense of negativity because I was already so excited and had positive buy-in for the project in total um, that I gave uh, those folks at the library and the Office of Public Arts benefit of the doubt um, before I said something on social media. Taylor, can we go to our next slide, please? Okay, so once we've got our audience or audiences in mind, um, we know the places where those audiences get their information. That's when we want to shift into thinking about messaging. And when I think about messaging, the place where I start first is I think, what kind of information does this audience member need in order to help us reach our goal? So do we need to persuade them to take some sort of action? Do they need to be educated in something that is going to be confusing to them? Um, do they need to understand more about historical precedent or some sort of history? Um, what information do they need in order to help us reach our goal? And after I think about that, then I think about how does this audience like to be communicated with? Um, are we working on a project where it would make sense to have a little bit of a sense of humor in the way that we're talking about things? Do we want to be more serious or do we want to be more lighthearted in the way that we're talking? Um, are we talking about a matter where there are potentially going to be a lot of community sensitivities? If so, we need to be really careful um, in our word choice. So that it really all goes back to that audience and clearly defining that audience at the outset. And that's going to help you answer all of these questions that follow. Okay, Taylor, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. The last piece that I want to mention to you before we shift into Q&A is that everyone on your team or in your coalition can and should contribute to communications and storytelling. So when we talk about communications, sometimes folks can slip into this mode of thinking, well, who on our team is the communications expert? Um, let's give them uh, all of the social media to do or something like that. But the truth is, when we're talking about communications, we all communicate, right? Some of us are better at social media. Some of us know how to talk with the press. Some of us can design a flyer. But then also, some of us are really good at one-on-one -on -one conversations, and we could be sending out personal emails to folks. Or we could be picking up the phone and calling people or having small group meetings um, and having coffee with folks. So when you're talking about telling your story, think about all of the different kinds of ways that we communicate. And don't just relegate that idea of storytelling to the person who has that specific technical expertise in doing something like, for example, social media. So that is my piece of the presentation. If we would like to um, switch into doing Q&A now. Thank you so much, Emma and Taylor. That was really great and informative. So people can submit questions through the question box or the chat box right now, and I can read those out loud. And while we're waiting here, I will also remind everyone that this information in this PowerPoint will be available on the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia website and our YouTube channel following uh, the upload and the download. So that is pawv.org. And you can check out any other of our previous presentations that we've been having since the end of April. So, 
Not seeing anything come in yet. Give everyone just another moment. Also, if you wanted to, you could raise your hand. It's easier for you to just talk over your microphone. Yeah, and if anyone wants to um, let us know just what they're working on right now, um, we'd be happy to chat further with you about your specific project and how our expertise may relate to that. Well, I have a question that I would like to ask um, for you both. Have you ever had an experience where people on the local level, mainly the commissioners um, and the mayor, are really adamantly opposed to what you're proposing? And it just seems like it's almost like a philosophical divide because they're just against what you're saying because they're against saving this building in particular in many cases because they have another future idea for maybe that loop that where that building is sitting. Have you ever had any experiences with dealing with that kind of friction or disagreement and how you managed that and navigated it? Was it successful in the end for your goal? Emma, I have some thoughts, but uh, do you want to go first or should I take it first? You take it first, but I have some thoughts too, because this is a common challenge. Um, so, but yeah, Taylor, please, you go first. All right. Um, yeah, like, like Emma said, I think that this is a challenge that lots of folks run into. Um, and uh, my, my personal experience with this has been at the state legislature rather than at the, the local level. But I think that because we're working, I mean, really one of the things that I would encourage people to think about um, is that we're working with people, right? Um, and when you build a coalition, your coalition members are people, but your decision makers are people too. Um, and so the, the ways that you might support or build a relationship with uh, with somebody are are the same uh, in a lot of ways. They're very very similar to how you would build any relationship. So, um, for example, there was a particular legislator who I knew um, carried a lot of weight about um, when when he would talk about land use um, and land reuse. And so, for a number of different objectives that. Um, the abandoned properties coalition had it was really important for for us to build a really strong relationship with him, and um, and basically I did that by being present um, and finding the the first thing that I did was I identified something a way that I could help him um, with something else a different thing, um, and so I went out of my way to be present um, in his community and to connect with him and communicate about support that I could provide about this other issue that was completely not related to what um, the policy objectives that I was working on. Um, it, and it was good work that he was doing that I was happy to support. So um, found a, a place of common ground there and then started building the relationship from there. Um, another thing that I would say, um, Danielle, in the example that you gave was you know, an individual who's really tied to this other idea and it like an, another idea of how that property could be used in the future or um, even just dedicated to the idea that it, it has to come down or whatever. Um, and, and I think that you can't, human, human beings are fun. Uh, we don't like to, I don't like to hear, uh, how my ideas aren't very good from people that I don't know very well, <laughs> or people that I feel like are not, uh, don't have my best interests at heart. But um, but I am more likely to sit and talk with folks that I um, have a good relationship with and, uh, and kind of feel like we're on the same team uh, and talk about other ways for my ideas to be used. So if you're if you're thinking about somebody who is opposed because they're really 
kind of emotionally attached to an idea about how property might be used in the future, you may choose to build build the relationship first and then talk about the kind of philosophical differences that you have or do some research about maybe their idea for that, you know, the, the cool use of the property that they want to do could be uh, done across the street or on a different property. Um, but they're not going to hear those ideas from somebody that they, they don't feel like is a team player with them. Um, and so I just really encourage everybody to kind of think about how you could build the relationship in order so that they will hear those ideas from a place of collaboration um, rather than confrontation. Yeah, definitely. Um, I agree with all of that. And it really echoes the remarks that I was going to make about this kind of work happening at the community level. Um, we uh, run into these kinds of similar challenges frequently um, in our community development work, which often becomes um, either historic preservation or um, the redevelopment of buildings or, um, and, um, people are invested uh, in these buildings, right? They're emotionally invested in them. They have dreams for them. They have memories tied to them. Um, and when those people hold positions of power, um, it, it, can, um, it can be a particularly challenging and like nuanced um, uh, issue to deal with. And, uh, the way that we look at it um, at the hub, at the community level, is just exactly what Taylor said at the state level, um, which is in how are we building up those personal relationships with people so that we can come to places of shared and common understanding? Um, and how are we um, uniting residents to work in coalition to work or to work as teams to work together um, so that it doesn't just become a situation where it looks like it's one person's voice set against another person's voice. Um, I had an idea for another area that maybe to cover that might be helpful for folks. Um, unless, Danielle, maybe if you have another specific question for us, but I thought about maybe talking a little bit more about if we're on social media and things go horribly wrong, what do we do about that? What What do you guys think about speaking to that? Yeah, I think that sounds like a really good point. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry if you just got a little bit of echo from me. Um. Okay. So, uh, can everyone still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 thank you. Um, I was worried that I messed up my audio there. Okay, so what if we go onto social media and things blow up in a really negative way um, and there turns out to be a lot of negative comments um, made about a project that we're working on, um, typical comments that I see related to this may be related to um, themes of gentrification or um, a, a planned use for a building that community members aren't in agreement with. Um, and so what do we do if there starts to be uh, that negative feedback loop that's happening on social media about our project? Well, the most important thing for us to think about in this kind of situation is that people want to be heard, right? They want to feel like they are being listened to. And this is true of all human beings. I'm not saying that to be to sound pedantic, right? We want to feel that if we have something that we feel passionate about and we feel really concerned about, that the person who is potentially like precipitating that action or taking some sort of, um, or creating that concern, hears us, um, understands what we're saying, um, and is taking those kinds of opinions into account. That doesn't mean that you have to do what the person said, right? It just means that 
people need to feel like they're being listened to and they need to to feel that authentically and sometimes we may find that um we are never going to resolve that kind of challenge within the social media space and i would advise you if depending on the amount of negativity the length of time that the negativity is going on to take it out of the virtual world and into the real world. Now, it's a little bit more complicated right now, right? Because we can't all be in rooms together. Um, but you could think about if we can't be face-to-face -face with one another, setting up something on a platform like Zoom, for example, that could even be live streamed to a social media account. Um, or setting up that real world space if it's an appropriate time to do so. And having a forum where you allow people to talk. Um, another thing that you could think about is opening up like um, using Google Forms to have like an open comment where people can submit their ideas and their thoughts and their comments. Um, and but what I recommend you do is Set up uh, methods for people to communicate with you that are outside of the social media space, but make sure that you're clearly communicating on social media what those methods are, right? We're hearing a lot of negative, this is me like writing a social media post. We're hearing a lot of negativity on social media right now around X, Y, and Z. And we wanna let you know that we hear you. Because we're hearing this negativity, we are setting up X, Y, or Z platform for people to share and let us know what their thoughts are. We will be, and here's another important part, report back then to the social media audiences about what you heard, any actions that you're planning to take, any changes that you're planning to make, how you're planning to maybe potentially add additional people into your coalition so those perspectives will be represented. Um, I will let you know that if you have a negative problem on a negative storyline going on on social media and, and you notice that it is prevalent enough or going on for long enough, even if it goes away, it will come back again. It, you will play whack-a-mole uh, with that negative storyline for as long as you're working on the project. And so if you have that like backup where you're saying, okay, we held a series of three community meetings to hear feedback on, on these matters. Here's what we heard. Here's where you can see our report out. Then you have a little bit of like fodder as those negative storylines percolate up again um, to be able to say, to show how you're taking action to address it. Um, I, I have found historically that when you set up these additional methods to communicate, the actual numbers of people that show up um, on these other platforms um, are usually fewer um, than what you see on social media. That doesn't mean that the viewpoints aren't uh, real or shouldn't be listened to or not authentic. It's just, like I told you earlier, it is the part of the business model of social media to show people negative information um, more frequently than positive information. Thank you, Emma. Um, I appreciate you commenting on that. And so we did have one question come in, mainly um, looking for more information about your agency or organization. And I really didn't think at the beginning that maybe folks aren't as familiar with your organization. So if you guys maybe wanted to share a little bit more about what you do and um, give your Facebook or website pages and where you guys are located, I think that would be great to end it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're the West Virginia Community Development Hub. Uh, we have about 10 people on our staff and we have offices in Charleston um, and then up in Grafton as well. Um, 
lot, we have multiple different approaches to our work, but we believe that um, community-led positive change is the most sustainable change that we can make um, if we want to build a path to prosperity for West Virginia. So what does that actually mean? Um, Last year, we worked uh, in about 21 different communities in the state doing in-depth community coaching with them. Those communities may have been working on things like how to improve small business and entrepreneurialism in their communities. They may be working on downtown redevelopment, redevelopment and historic uh, building redevelopment. Um, they may be working on improving tourism. So whatever they envision for the communities, um, for their own communities, we support them in helping to make those changes. Um, then, then we also have two other major pieces of our work. Um, and one of them is our communications work, which is what I do um, in helping to tell the story of that positive change that's happening on the ground and to support people in building their skills and telling stories. And then Taylor, do you want to talk more about your work? Absolutely. So um, just like Emma said uh, about like sustainable lasting change has to be led by communities and we really believe that that sustainable lasting change is going to take some policy change too. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, kind of carrying through that ethos is that if that policy change is not led by community members, if that policy change isn't um, identified by and kind of advocated for by community members, it, it won't be sustainable. It won't provide the kind of change that needs to happen in order for, for that sort of lasting um, sustainable prosperity to be built in our state. Um, the, the policy program kind of tries to enact this value at, at the state level. Um, all of our state level work right now focuses um, on our work through the Abandoned Properties Coalition, um, which is uh, how I kind of come to be connected with the Preservation Alliance and with Danielle. Danielle's a member of our steering committee. Um, and uh, the Abandoned Properties Coalition is a, is a group of kind of uh, like it's a statewide group of technical assistance providers like the Preservation Alliance um, that kind of deal with the various um, and really broad issues uh, surrounding vacant, abandoned, and dilapidated properties. Um, and so uh, that the Abandoned Properties Coalition will form policy teams that then advocate for um, policy issues, policy solutions, uh, things that we think would, would kind of help to address this challenge in our state at the state level. Um, we'll take those to the, uh, to the Capitol. Um, if anybody's interested, uh, many of you may remember the state historic tax credit, an increase to our state historic tax credit, which was passed several years ago. Um, uh, Danielle was really instrumental in our uh, team that worked on that policy issue. And um, that team will be forming again because uh, not this coming legislative session, but the legislative session in uh, 2022, uh, it will see the sunset of that state historic tax credit um, unless we're able to advocate to get that sunset clause removed. Um, uh, I feel confident that we'll be able to do that, but uh, we're, we're excited to work together again uh, to make sure that we're able to keep that really valuable tool for, um, for folks in, in West Virginia to use. The policy program also kind of tries to enact this community-led policy change um, uh, value at the local level too. Um, and we provide, I provide support for uh, community members across the state who are interested in um, seeing changes made in their local policy. Um, and if you're interested in um, more information about that, please feel free to send me an email. My email is listed on the slide that's up right now. Thank you so much again, Emma and Taylor. Uh, I think that's it for today. So um, we look forward to meeting with you all again in person one day soon. And if anyone wants to view these again in the future, the, like I said, they'll be on our website at pawv.org. And our final webinar next week will be a totally different topic, uh, laser scanning for historic preservation. So you can join us next week at one o'clock on Wednesday for that with Paula McLean. And thank you again, Taylor and Emma. Uh, it was really great having you guys today. I hope so you all have a great day. Happy to be here.
Stay safe out there. Take care.